My name is Leopold Kass. I modified my last name upon arrival in the United States. My previous family name was Kahn, K-O-N. And uh, the reasons for this change was uh, uh, mainly the very unpleasant relationship of the term of the original name with French vocabulary, which for many years was my primary language. So upon arrival in the United States, I, I became a KOSS uh, and uh, kept my first name. I was born in, uh, I was born in 1920, on October 2, 1920, in the city of Gdansk or Danzig. And the reason for this birth in this location was the Bolshevik-Polish War uh, in 1920. As the Bolsheviks were approaching Warsaw, my parents escaped to what was then the free city of Danzig, and I was born there by, by an accident. Shortly after the war, which ended with a victory, Polish victory anyway, and uh, we returned to, to Warsaw, which is where we lived until 1927. So the first seven years of my life took place in Warsaw which was then the capital city of Poland. It is of some interest to, to you and that Polish was the primary language uh, of my childhood uh, and uh, that both my parents belonged to what you might call progressive Jews who believed that, uh, that uh, assimilation of Jews in Poland was possible. They represented a minority at that time, but, uh, and of course failed to prevail anyway. In any event, uh, we were living in a building in Warsaw, which exists until today, survived the war and survived the, you know, the uh, various post-war events, and I even managed to visit it several times together with my sons. I have three sons for the record. Did you the, have siblings? You, no. My, my parents and only sister perished during the Holocaust, and I will talk about this in a little while. Okay. And maybe you could about this. Stop sisters. now because I want to take a deep breath. Okay. Should we stop it? You know, stop it now. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I, I came. Uh, I'm the offspring of two distinguished Polish Jewish families. My uh, mother's uh, uh, background was in Warsaw. Her grandfather, whose name was Merenholtz, M-E-R-E-N-H-O-L-Z, uh, was a, uh, had a brickyard. And they used to say that Warsaw was built with the bricks of, of Merenholtz. My father's family came from the city of Lodz, which is a uh, industrial city of, um, largely uh, dedicated to production of textiles. And his family was uh, very active in some of the uh, textile activities, um, factories and so forth and so on. And they were, the family was, not, was a large family and it was not always unified. But nonetheless, uh, it was uh, a very interesting background for me um, to assess in the later years. Our childhood was uh, spent in a, a large apartment 
in Warsaw, uh, in a building which, as I said, is still standing. And that's where my sister was born in 1924, on January 17th, 1924. And uh, we lived uh, in a city which at that time was, as I said before, the capital of Poland, and um, we were fairly well to do until 1927, where my father's business, which I believe was in textiles, I don't really know the details of that, uh, until he went bankrupt. And then we had to move to the city of Łódź or Lodz, L-O-D-Z, which is where my father, father's family was uh, dwelling. Um, we lived through some very difficult times during the Depression, 1927-28. And I recall very well that we had, there was not enough money to keep the apartment warm, and there wasn't even enough money to feed us properly. And, uh, and these were difficult times which lasted for several years. Our period, I was a precocious child. I, could, uh, I, I was reading and writing Polish anyway, at the age of five. Did you uh, speak any other languages? At that time we didn't. And the Yiddish, which was a common language of Polish Jews, was not spoken at home except between my parents when they wanted to keep something secret from the children, which was really rather ridiculous because the children understood it very rapidly. And uh, there were no, no very significant secrets uh, to keep from us. In any event, I went to school, the so-called gymnasium, where I did extremely well, to the point where I got my baccalaureate, or BS equivalent, at the age of 16. And that was when Hitler's time began, and it so happens that because of, um, that I have witnessed personally several of the events and that uh, preceded the war, and some of them were rather interesting. Um, after my baccalaureate, uh, I really wanted to do some physics or my mathematics, because I was pretty good at it. But the consensus of my parents was that I better go into medicine, which was a better way of making a living in those days, and even perhaps today. <coughs> and therefore, because it was virtually impossible for Jewish people to get into Polish universities, because of the so-called numerous clauses, which means limitation of Jews to 10% of students. And I, was, um, I went to Vienna to study medicine in 1937. I was not quite 17 years old at that time. And this uh, stay in Vienna was uh, remarkable for a number of issues including uh, getting to know the, you know, the West, get the taste of Western Europe, which was really not very readily available in Poland. And, uh, but they also made me a witness to the so-called Anschluss when Germans overtook Austria and became the masters of Austria. And that sequence of events was extraordinarily interesting because the Austrians were a good Catholic uh, nation and uh, had a chancellor whose name was Shushnik. And um, Mr. Shushnik resisted Hitler's ultimatums and uh, wanted to keep Austria an independent country, but he was brutally overruled. Ready now. You could go. And the, uh, in spite of uh, Shushnik's efforts, uh, um, the Nazi troops actually entered Vienna on the evening of uh, March, Friday, March 11, 1938. 
and I witnessed uh, the uh, transformation of the Austrian people from good patriotic Catholics that they were wearing red, white, red signs in their lapels uh, overnight into, into uh, swastikas. I believe that the Austrians were extraordinarily happy with Hitler. They were the most enthusiastic Nazis, much more enthusiastic, I believe, in retrospect than the Germans themselves. I witnessed some of the early anti-Semitic events in Vienna where people, uh, Jewish families, were forced by their neighbors to, to, to wash the sidewalks with the toothbrushes and uh, uh, s several other episodes in which I'm not going to repeat here. In any event, I was scheduled to return home for, for Easter vacation and uh, a couple of days after Hitler's uh, uh, invasion of Austria, I went to the uh, s station, take a train home, and I was stopped by the Gestapo. But because I was a foreign citizen with a Polish passport, they let me go. Uh, I returned. On my way home, I watched Czechoslovakia getting ready to repulse Hitler's advances at that time, they were digging trenches, making uh, anti-tank obstacles, and all that kind of thing. But obviously that came to naught, because in October 1938, Chamberlain and Deladier actually sold Czechoslovakia to Hitler under the pretext that they are returning just the Sudetenland. Um, it was one of the most disgusting and meaningless gestures of the Western Allies prior to World War II. Upon return home, I found that the interest, uh, the, the people were extraordinarily interested about the events in Vienna, and I could tell them um, many stories which I have personally witnessed. And some of them are, are Jewish friends decided that it was getting too, Europe was getting too dangerous and they tried to, at least tried to get the British visa to go to what was then Palestine. There was no Israel at that time, of course. And some members of our family managed to escape at that time, just before the onset of World War II. My parents, on the other hand, didn't really believe that anything too, t too terrible will happen and they, they remained in the city of Lodge, where we were living. And um, in fact, uh, it was decided for me to return to Vienna to finish the, the school year and to take some exams and before going on to further, for further education. Uh, this is what happened. I returned to Vienna for another two and a half months of, of study and watched to my horror that many of my uh, instructors and professors uh, started wearing Nazi uniforms uh, while the student, most of the students were still in civilian clothing. So that, as I said before, the enthusiasm of the Austrians for the Nazis was just absolutely unbelievable. And today, of course, they claim that they were victims of Mr. Hitler. I can tell you from personal experience that they were enthusiastic supporters. In any event, I finished the school year not by taking some exams and returning home to, to, to Poland. Um, and it was then decided that I cannot really, that I should look for another medical school to continue my studies. Stop them, they said, ring. Okay. It was uh, then decided that uh, uh, perhaps I should try to continue my studies at the University of Brussels. Now, Brussels at that time was a neutral country. Um, and it, it had a medical school which was well-renowned which uh, offered to, uh, very good education to 
uh, in French, by the way. Uh, Thus, uh, I was forced to learn French, or at least some command of French, before I went to Brussels. And the year in Brussels was very interesting for a number of reasons. And one of them was that it was, for me, uh, an extraordinary opportunity to be introduced to classical music <laughs> because <laughs> because the, the, all the great soloists and orchestras were passing through Brussels before the war, before either on the way from or to Paris or Berlin, and they were always making a little stop there. In any event, there also were some opportunities for a young medical student to and get involved with uh, some interesting women and all that kind of thing it was a part of my experience, but I'm not going to talk about sex life and <laughs> my sex life at this point because that would be another tape which would not be accessible to young people. In any event, I, and it was uh, a, a, an extraordinary useful year to me. I really learned a lot and I mastered French, which was helpful. And then, after having passed the examinations for this year in Brussels, I decided to return home to Poland, and that was in July 1939. In July 1939 was just six weeks or maybe two months before the onset of World War II. So we went, I went back to Poland, and at that time Hitler started his ultimatums uh, directed towards the Poles at that time. You do this. The, he, he was mainly concerned and expressed his concern about the German citizens living in Poland, many of whom lived in the city where I lived, which was called Lodz at that time. The... Uh, and nonetheless, we passed a peaceful vac- vacation period, you know, some in July and August, went to the countryside, as was customary, until the end of August, and the uh, probability of war s- uh, increased significantly, and we returned from the countryside to Lodz. The war for me started on September 1, 1939, when my mother woke me up around 5 a.m. saying there's some strange noises in the sky, and that was the first first German planes flying over the city, and uh, it became quite evident very rapidly that the Polish defenses were not up to snuff. Uh, to to resist the German uh, attack, and uh, the, that could be best noticed by the fact that the radio stations, the Polish radio stations in the what was Polish West, were getting silent very rapidly. So it means that uh, the territory was being occupied by the Germans. Around the third or fourth of September, I think it was on the morning of the fourth of September. The, the local radio station, which was still functioning, declared that all citizens, age, male citizens, age 18 and above, should now go east to escape the Germans and for the Polish army to, to, to uh, offer some res- meaningful resistance. So at around 3 o'clock in the morning on the uh, September 4th, um, we started walking east, which at that time meant going to back to the capital city of Warsaw. To make a long story short, uh, I found myself in Warsaw uh, a couple of days later, having witnessed on the, on the way the uh, German planes shooting at the escaping population and the refugees and things like that, killing a lot of people. I was lucky, and I wasn't even, I had no problems at all crossing to Warsaw, where 
my father joined me and we stayed with one of my mother's sisters in the heart of the city. And that was followed by a siege of Warsaw, which was one of the few resistance points the Germans encountered during the Polish campaign. Uh, and uh, uh, the city was being defended by the remains of the Polish army and by a very enthusiastic civilian population which was trying to, uh, to prevent the Germans from occupying the city. Obviously it was help hopeless, especially when on September 17th, the news broke that the Soviet troops entered east to eastern Poland and occupied it, so that the Poland was being divided into two parts, one belonging to, to the communists uh, and one belonging to Mr. Hitler and his troops. So the siege of Warsaw came to an end uh, on the 28th of September 1939, and then and both my father and I decided to return home to Lodz, which is where my mother and sister were remaining. And that's where some of the first violent anti-Semitic uh, manifestations uh, were observed. Uh, because to my personal significant distress, the, our Polish co-citizens who were Catholic and were pointing out Jews to the Germans. The Germans didn't know how to differentiate between Jews and non-Jews. But the Polish uh, compatriots were extremely helpful to the Germans, and they promptly learned the word Jude to, show, to say Jew, and pointed out to people, they said Jew, it's a Jew, it's a Jew. And both my father and I were then engaged to go to work in the gas works of Poland, of, of Warsaw, uh, which were burning from the uh, as a remnant of the bombardment of Warsaw. Uh, to make a long story short, um, we managed to escape that after a little while. And uh, again, before going back home to Lodge, we experienced several several very, very, very drastic manifestations of Polish anti-Semitism which came to the surface uh, like, a, uh, like a cork in a, in, a, in a glass of water. It was really a very surprising, very, very surprising event. In fact, since you asked me this question, it was the, really the first time that I personally experienced Polish anti-Semitism. Stop now. It's the Are you ready? Time. My father and I returned from Warsaw to our home city of Lodz, L-O-D-Z, in the early October 1939. To begin with, nothing happened. The Germans were occupying the city and they promptly appointed several of the local German people to various bureaucratic positions, and they were essentially running the city. It then turned out that the German population of the city of Lodz, who constituted about 10%, demanded an incorporation of the city into the German Reich. And that happened, that was accomplished in the early days of November 1939, and Lodge became known as Lützmannstadt, named after a German general who uh, was victorious over Russian troops in 1914. Once it became a German city, there was no further border between this part of Poland, which was incorporated into the Reich, and the German Reich. 
and they set up a train service from Lodz to Germany without border, without an intervening border. It was also became possible because of some of the German officials who became the masters of life in the city of Lodz to obtain an exit permit from the German Reich. And because I was a student in Brussels just before the war, I still had some Belgian documents with me. And through an accident, if you will, I was able to obtain a stamp, an exit stamp, from the city of Litzmannstadt to leave Germany. My mother, who by then had was convinced that nothing good will come out of the German occupation, uh, was very instrumental in helping me make up my mind to try this escape route. And today with, and that day on the 18th of November, 1939, together with a buddy of mine who died just a few years ago, and we got on the German train going to Germany in the morning. And the train was quite empty. And after some eight hours, we arrived into the city of Breslau, which is now a part of Poland known as Wrocław. The buddy of mine and I decided to try to obtain some train tickets to go to Belgium. And because he spoke, he didn't speak any German, and I did, he stayed with our luggage in the station, a huge railroad station, and I went outside to purchase tickets to go to Brussels. And I found a, 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 an office, a railroad uh, ticket office or something like that, a travel agency really. And I walk, went in and I said, I'd like to have some train tickets to Brussels. And they said, no, they couldn't issue tickets to Brussels, but they could issue tickets to the Belgian border. So I said, okay. And we still had some money, German marks. And after about an hour, I received two railroad tickets to good to the Belgian border. And then at four o'clock that afternoon, there was an express train going from, Bre from Bre Breslau to Berlin and both uh, this buddy of mine, a friend of mine, and I took this train and traveled all the way to Berlin in the company of Germans. And one episode that I remember particularly well is that I was sitting next to the window reading a German newspaper and smoking. And across the aisle from me sat a fat German who at every station, wherever the train stopped, was lowering the window and greeting the German soldiers as victorious in Poland. And uh, I started coughing, as I always do after smoking, and he was very friendly to me. He said, you cough, this is a, a typical cough of a smoker, why don't you have a candy? And he offered me a candy. And it was an extraordinary journey. We arrived in Berlin at dusk, or later on perhaps, had something to eat, and then waited for the train going west towards the Belgian border, which we uh, caught around 11 p.m. And the train was full of German soldiers who were going to the front with France at that time. 
and they were spend spend the night singing all kinds of old fashioned German songs, and the two Jewish boys that we were we were just sitting quietly in our corner, saying nothing, and we find him at six o'clock. We managed to get to the city of Köln or Cologne, and then we disembarked. Had to change trains, visited the local cathedral, visited the city. Spend whatever residual money we had buying some stuff, and then we got on a train to the border, which was uh, the city of uh, Aix la Chapelle, or a uh, well known borderline city with Belgium. And there, unfortunately, our, our holiday stopped because we were. To make a long story short, we were stopped by the Gestapo, who were very suspicious of the two characters like us. Interestingly enough, they did not consider us as Jews, but they considered us as Poles. And they kept asking questions about our fathers being officers in the Polish army and all that kind of thing. They never asked if you were yeah, yeah, they never did. They never did. Wow. They never did at that time.